Uh, Rylan's going to discuss some of the new impacts, uh, some of the impacts of the new arena development on pre-existing community members, especially heightened levels of racialized policing and displacement of city center residents, including folks who are houseless and or precariously housed, many of whom in, Ed in Edmonton are, of course, Indigenous. The last part of our discussion what is, was going last night? is going to be led by Dr. Mm. Jim Edmonton, who will provide an analysis of how ongoing settler colonialism in Edmonton is concomitantly massaged through the development of socially conscious public art projects, including the new arena mural installation, Pillars of the Community, which is located okay. just to the north <laughs> of in Edmonton. And I think somebody's uh, volume is on. Just we can hear you laughing if you wouldn't mind taking care of that. Thank you. These projects will suggest function uh, as a neoliberal mechanism to manage social difference in a city space of radical disjuncture and inequity in Treaty 6 territory. Okay, besides marking this presentation and this panel with an introductory land acknowledgement, however, and as our discussion focuses on issues affecting those who are sleeping rough, those who are houseless, and those who are over-policed, we want to advocate acting for change by amplifying in this moment the work of Treaty 6 Community Outreach in Edmonton, uh, a grassroots mutual aid network focused on social justice advocacy, street outreach, and harm reduction. And sadly, these are practices that are so urgently needed in Edmonton City Centre in 2021. So those of you who are interested, you can follow them on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, and I know they'd be happy to hear from you if you have any inquiries or if you have the ability to make a donation, you can reach them at treaty6outreach at gmail.com. The opening of Rogers Place, uh, a publicly financed $613.7 million arena in 2016 was the culmination of a contentious multi-year political debate in Edmonton, which followed the usual script through which the owners of major league sports franchises extract scarce public resources from municipalities to subsidize their multifaceted business interests, which now include land development. The debate included the now standard threat by the team's owner to relocate the Oilers franchise to another city. The same tactic that was, of course, used by the former owner of the Oilers in the 1990s, Peter Pocklington, to secure various concessions from the city of Edmonton, including the renovation of the city's old arena, the publicly funded Coliseum, which opened in 1974, not that long ago. The Coliseum, like Rogers Place, is also city owned and is still standing to this day as an unused white elephant. That alone costs taxpayers $1.5 million a year in maintenance costs just to keep standing and just to keep closed. In building Rogers Place, the city of Edmonton agreed to use hundreds of millions of dollars of public funds to build a newer facility and agreed to cede full operational control of the new arena and all of its revenue to the Cates Group until 2051 to ensure both the profitability of the Oilers for their foreseeable future but also to quote, revitalize Edmonton's urban core you know, as a spectacular center of consumption that would, it was hoped, boost municipal property tax revenue as well. And its boosters and its main beneficiaries have heralded the new arena and ICE district for revitalizing a commercially underdeveloped part of Edmonton's urban core and for providing the types of upmarket, leisure and investment opportunities that any city aspiring to so-called world-class status seeks to provide, including new office towers, condominiums, public plaza, and a host of other upmarket amenities that are being developed by the Cates Group, which had been well positioned to revalorize urban land that it had purchased years earlier at much lower prices. Indeed, as a much used contemporary strategy of neoliberal urban governance across North America, and as part of an ongoing cycle of accumulation by dispossession in Edmonton, ICE District is intended to entice affluent members of the creative class to work, to live, and to play in Edmonton's downtown core. And in Edmonton, developers 
have explicitly used the language of terra nullius in reference to Edmonton city center, reinvoking settler colonial logics to pave the way for aggressive gentrification. In other words, to resettle through making through the remaking of this urban frontier. And we think that this next image, an advertisement that was put up outside <laughs> one of the <laughs> office towers in the city center in Edmonton speaks precisely to who has been invited to belong to this particular set of amenities, to take up space, to take up residence, and indeed to live in this particular community. This is for us a really, really important point. Because the downtown area that was targeted for revitalization so many years ago, like innumerable city centers throughout North America, was already a vital and diverse community before ICE District. Edmonton and its downtown core was originally settled following a foundational genocidal cycle of territorial acquisition, enclosure, and dispossession based on the doctrine of discovery. Over the course of many decades, of the 20th century, Edmonton Central Core has been a vibrant community. In the post-war years of the mid 20th century, white middle-class residents left the city center for a growing suburbia. Concomitantly, the gradual abolition of the pass system, which severely limited the mobility of indigenous individuals beyond reserved reserves, as well as state encouraged urban migration from reserves, produced an identifiable urban indigenous community in central Edmonton, where housing was relatively affordable. Alongside a well-established black community, as well as Chinatown, local businesses supported a racially diverse community in the city's downtown in an otherwise hostile prairie settler city. This neighborhood is now one that is marked by the lively street life that is born of spatially concentrated racialized poverty with a sizable houseless community, many of whom are indigenous. These counter publics, of course, have been historically the target of state violence and a range of techniques of elimination and containment within the dominant settler colonial order. These dynamics also spurred the centralized location of a number of nonprofit social service agencies, shelters, and a significant amount of social housing. This is in addition to numerous local businesses and community hubs like the Baccarat Casino and the Greyhound bus station on this slide, working class pubs and single room occupancy hotels, many of which have been closed and of course torn down to make way for the developments noted earlier. Building on historical settler colonial tropes, this was the broad area that local arena boosters and civic leaders declared to be an unproductive dead zone a wasteland. In other words, urb nullius, urban space devoid of indigenous sovereign presence in their pursuit of a revanchist growth agenda. Indeed, after one ICE, uh, one, sorry, after ICE district opened, one columnist in the Edmonton Sun uh, opined that he was personally relieved to now see, quote, normal people downtown for a change who were helping Edmonton take back the night. End quote. This, of course, highlights Patrick Wolfe's observation that settler colonialism is an ongoing structure and not a singular historical event. Such media rhetoric only reconsolidated the, the disconnect between different communities who, in 2016, when the new arena opened, started sharing space differently in Edmonton's downtown core. The money developers represented by the Cates Group and by extension the city of Edmonton had been concerned about luring suburban Oilers supporters and investors to ICE District, an area that for so many years had been represented as seedy and as dangerous. Sports fans and pre-existing downtown residents were going to be governed and policed through more pronounced uh, technologies of regulation and segregation as they have in so many other cities across North America where these developments have been built in less affluent urban areas. And one final note before I turn it over to Rylan, by policing, we mean the deployment of the resources of the state and private security to A, protect the financial interests of the Cates Group by ensuring the safe and regulated and unfettered mobility of affluent hockey fans and concert goers to and from ICE District, and B, to monitor and potentially remove community members, including panhandlers, 
bottle pickers, houseless folks, and others who might be participating in the night, nighttime economy of arena events, a different economy not countenanced by a different class of wealth holders. At this point, I'm going to switch it over to Rylan to talk about our ethnography. Thank you, Jay. Hi, everyone. I'll be sharing some stories and themes that came out of our two-year ethnography of the first two NHL seasons at Rogers Place in 2016 to 17 and 2017 to 18, including the 2017 playoff run, which lasted all the way into the second round. So over the first two seasons, we observed policing's role in ensuring the conditions for sport-related gentrification. In support of these conditions, police and private security guide and guarantee the public flow and safe passage of sport fans according to the values of what Blomley calls pedestrianism, while also enforcing dominant social norms related to the conduct of sport consumers and the uses of urban spaces. Our study found that the economic success of the arena was the clear policing priority and was accomplished through what Stewart refers to as therapeutic policing and punitive policing. On the surface, therapeutic policing may seem compassionate, but still results in the displacement of city center residents. Punitive policing is more overt and explicit from physical removal to fines, arrest, and escalating forms of intimidation and force. Many of the encounters that we witnessed between Edmonton Police Service, or EPS, private security, and city center residents on game nights were representative of therapeutic policing. Ultimately though, therapeutic policing has the same outcome as more punitive measures. And in ICE District, both punitive and therapeutic Therapeutic policing resulted in the removal of city center residents. However, in response, city center residents developed cop wisdom where folks learned and enacted a number of techniques to avoid police in the new urban sports frontier. So as a research team, we hung out around Rogers Place prior to, during, and after over 50 Edmonton Oilers home games. We walked in and at times against the public flow of the consumption of professional sport. We walked around the arena and around the broader police perimeter of Ice District, on the sidewalks of main streets and thoroughfares, especially where hockey fans are directed to the main entrance of Rogers Place. We observed and documented numerous interactions between city center residents, police, private security and Oilers fans, especially during the pre-game buildup and post-game dispersion. We conducted this research over the course of the cold winter months in Edmonton, where temperatures were regularly below 10 degrees Celsius. We also visited coffee shops, pubs, and ice districts, various amenities, including the casino, the community rink, and the main entrance to the arena itself, privatized spaces that are not often available to less affluent residents. For those not familiar with the area, here's a map. The area includes the spaces that are used by Oilers fans and city center residents in competing ways, including around the McEwen Light Rail Transit or LRT station, a main transportation hub located behind Rogers Place, which takes hockey fans to the smaller entrance behind the arena. The McEwen LRT station is also in close proximity to various shelters and social service agencies, and some residents often attempt to seek shelter and warmth within the station. The nearest agency is Boyle Street Community Services, located just behind and to the east of Rogers Place, beside a thoroughfare that takes fans to the rear entrance of the arena. Boyle Street provides a host of services for city center residents, including a daytime drop-in center that often offers food and shelter. I also spent a number of game nights traveling on ride-alongs with the 24-7 mobile assistance van based out of Boyle Street which provides support and aid for community members, especially during the winter around the clock. Another of these mobile assistance vehicles operated by another nearby social organization, the Hope Mission, is parked here in the photo, which was taken just north of the arena. The photo here on, in the upper left corner is a view of the arena from the front entrance of Boyle Street. Below it is an example of police directing traffic before a game on the southwest edge of the arena. The photos to the right are of EPS in front of Boyle Street during games. So on game nights, EPS are prominently stationed at key intersections and thoroughfares, 
especially along the sidewalk in front of the arena and various roadways to guide traffic and fans during moments of significant pre and post game congestion. The EPS and LRT security maintain a significant presence at the McEwen LRT station just behind Rogers Place, while private Rogers Place security at the arena are also prominent at the main and rear entrances. During the hockey game though, security and EPS retreat into Rogers Place, returning to their positions outside of the facility just prior to the conclusion of the game. From our earliest night of field work in 2016, the ubiquitous presence of the EPS and private security around Rogers Place was obvious a fact not lost on less affluent residents. One indigenous community member noted to us, whenever he was asked for directions to Rogers Place by hockey fans or concert goers, he would tell them, if you see cops, you know you're in the right place. On most evenings, we regularly observed EPS or Rogers Place security encouraging community members and panhandlers to make their way to various downtown shelters, guiding them away from Rogers Place and from the sidewalks and spaces around the arena. This is therapeutic policing. For example, the evening of November 28, 2017, we overheard a peace officer in a discussion with an indigenous city center resident beside the Grand Villa Casino, just next to Rogers Place, here on the left hand side in the photos. The officer asked if the resident would like him to call the mobile assistance van for transport to a shelter. Sure, the resident responds. However, before the van arrives, the resident walks away, heading away from the arena. The peace officer does nothing further and wishes him well. Stay safe and be warm. This interaction was not overly aggressive or hostile. Still, the central messages of these practices are both coercively conductive, keep moving, and paternalistic in relation to individual conduct. Go to a shelter, sober up, seek other assistance for your personal troubles. Another example of therapeutic policing is from this photo on the right. It was taken shortly before one of the Oilers playoff games in 2017. This indigenous woman had been cheering, let's go Oilers, along with the huge crowd of Oilers fans, all in jerseys, preparing to go inside the arena for the game. Security singled her out, took her out of the crowd of paying fans, and escorted her all the way back to the bench in front of Boyle Street, making it clear who doesn't belong here. Pictured here is the mobile assistance van responding to a call at the arena. In another example of therapeutic policing, when city center residents ignored requests to keep moving, a mobile assistance van was often called by Rogers Place security to transport individuals to nearby shelters. These requests, however, place significant demands on an under-resourced nonprofit sector, including enlisting and prioritizing the labor of the workers of the mobile assistant van, assistance van. So, we found that the mobile assistance van was being used to support and secure the interests of major league sport within ICE district. As one, as one van staff member confided, they felt conflicted about being asked by security at Rogers Place to displace city center residents from these central spaces, rather than working to fulfill their traditional mandate of helping those in need. One van member said, Rogers Place and other businesses, they'll call our team to remove someone, but they don't wanna to talk to community members they just want them gone. While displays of therapeutic policing were common on game nights, we also observed a number of more punitive measures. An explicit example of this occurred on March 12, 2017, just prior to the start of the Oilers game. Three indigenous city center residents, including one in a wheelchair, were removed from the McEwen LRT station, pictured on the left, by transit officers for not having train tickets. They were inside the station, but not on a platform where a ticket was required. What the fuck are we supposed to do? One remarked to us. It's freezing outside. All three individuals proceeded to return to Boyle Street in search of temporary shelter before deciding to move on to another LRT station in a continuous cycle of survival. Another stark example of punitive policing to ensure the public flow of a sporting event and the safety of Oilers fans was an incident that occurred on October 14th, 2017. A block away from Rogers Place, we encountered Ted, a middle-aged indigenous man who was yelling out, Ottawa, Ottawa. That night, the Oilers were playing the Ottawa Senators. Ted was laughing and joking with, with some Oilers fans while other fans gave him a wide berth. Ted's presence did not go unnoticed by two police officers who were directing fans across the street. 
When Ted stepped off the curb onto the street, though, he was very quickly and physically pushed away from Oilers fans and from the perimeter of ICE districts by both police officers. Here is a video, of, video recording of that interaction. On our digital platform, it's difficult to hear the audio until the end, but this video gives you a visual idea of the interaction and the message behind it. I also took notes of the interaction, which you can see to the right of the video. Kids around here, and you're gonna, you're gonna be scaring some. You don't want to go to jail, do you? I don't want to take you to jail. Hey, can you have a drink for your cigarettes? Oh, sorry, man. I... Oh, it's a cigar? Oh, it's my a cigar. goodness. Buddy. I thought it was a <laughs> cigarette. Dude. No, it's a... It's Listen, a beat it. Okay, go. Get out of here. Move along. Let's go. The claim that served as the foundation for the officer's threat of arrest and imprisonment that Ted could have potentially scared children as opposed to the loud and intoxicated white hockey fans reconsolidated in a long-standing practice of EPS racial profiling was completely unfounded. There were no children whatsoever in the near vicinity. Ted was, however, identifiably indigenous and not completely docile in his interactions with fans or with the police themselves the officers themselves, precisely because he continued to stand his ground and chant. He was subsequently targeted for removal through the threat of going to prison and, after being subjected to such public abuse from the police and some hockey fans, he left the area. We chatted with Ted as he left. He noted that this had been the first instance that he had been threatened by police in the ICE district, but he also underlined that many of his Indigenous friends had been surveilled, ticketed, and harassed downtown by the police in recent years. Later that evening, we watched numerous white Oilers fans jaywalking across the same street without police interference, one with an open beer in hand. We also watched numerous other groups of overwhelmingly white fans chanting and singing while being safely escorted across the same intersection by police. Actions and practices that are not regularly afforded to city center residents like Ted in the new arena environment. In our discussions with city center residents, we were regularly told that these types of aggressive and demeaning interactions were not uncommon. We witnessed an example of the types of consequences that can ensue for city center residents who attract the attention of police, consequences that can have powerful effects on their life trajectories. On a particularly cold evening in early March 2017, as we walked behind the arena prior to the start of a hockey game, we watched two young Indigenous men approach Rogers Place on bicycles. The pair of cyclists were stopped by officers in an EPS vehicle which was parked and running in front of Boyle Street. The officers sat in their warm car and joked as they wrote up violations, while the two young men were forced to wait as fans walked by and stared at them. After being served their tickets, the young men proceeded to walk quickly north, away from the arena, pushing their bikes. We caught up with them and asked what had happened. The young men noted their frustration and confusion. Each of them had received a ticket for not having lights on their bikes, but for separate amounts, $177 and $78. The more excessive ticket had, in fact, been issued, issued to the cyclist who had a light and a bell on the front of his bike, but was missing a light on the back. Humiliated and despondent over receiving such an exorbitant ticket, he asked us, why did they give me a bigger ticket? It doesn't make any sense. And they made us stand outside for 15 minutes. These tickets are more bewildering and frustrating experiences. They're more than that. They funnel young people, and particularly young people of color, into the carceral prison industrial complex. Punitive policing is integral to the ever-expanding carceral system. Many city center residents have simply learned to either stay away from the securitized perimeter of the arena and ICE district, or outwit the police, especially if they want to panhandle on game nights. This exemplifies cop wisdom, including techniques to avoid the cops, such as humor, friendliness, sobriety, and docility. 
These responses to policing of the area was a common theme in our discussion, discussions with city centre folks, many of whom have been pushed out of their own community, especially on game nights. The EPS and private security are a crucial part of the surveillance assemblage that is professional sports, property developers, and municipal governments. Thus, many city centre residents often forego calling the police when they are threatened or are in danger. The police are everywhere downtown, but often nowhere at the same time, depending on how one is socially positioned and perceived. Over the two years of our ethnography, a small number of city centre residents adjusted to the heightened police and security presence in ways that allowed them to remain in spaces around the arena on game nights. Docility as a form of cop wisdom was on display on March 10th, 2018. Gary, a middle-aged Indigenous community member, was panhandling directly in front of Roger's place on the sidewalk and just west of the main entrance. Gary told us, the cops don't bother me as long as I'm not bothering anyone else. The cops are letting me stay tonight, no trouble. However, to be allowed to stay in this location, Gary understood that he needed to be both completely docile and stationary while panhandling. He also knew that he needed to remove himself from the direct public flow of hockey fans and be just close enough to the edge of that flow to receive the offer of coins. And not coincidentally, he was out of sight from the eyes of police by positioning himself behind a garbage can close to the exterior wall of the arena and by sitting quietly and cross-legged, head down and cap out. Almost two years after the arena opened, Gary's unfettered presence inside the securitized arena zone was both surprising to our research team and indicative of the behavioral shifts required to be able to stay put in Edmonton's ICE district. So this new urban sports frontier is where city center residents navigate a downtown structured by gentrification through what Ray Reese calls carceral redlining or the continuation of white supremacy through regulation, surveillance, displacement and dispossession. Thank you. I'll now pass it over to Judy for the final part of our presentation. Thanks, Rylan. So I'm gonna finish our presentation today by discussing a public art project called Pillars of the Community. Uh, you can see two sides of it here in this image. It's an art installation that is found at the Northeast corner of the arena. The city of Edmonton and the Cates Group have used multiple strategies in their quest to mobilize Rogers Place as an apparatus of gentrification in downtown Edmonton. Some of these tactics, as you have just heard from Ryland, are explicit and literal attempts to erase pe particular people from the area through racialized policing and displacement. This structure of ongoing settler colonialism in Edmonton is also produced through the development of what I call socially conscious public art projects. In this section, we consider how this arena mural installation works as a neoliberal mechanism to manage social difference in a city space of radical disjuncture and inequity. In November of 2016, the Pillars of the Community public art installation was unveiled behind Rogers Place. In distinct juxtaposition to the other four officially commissioned pieces of contemporary art found in and around the new arena, Pillars of the Community was an initiative independent of the Cates Oilers Group and was funded by the Edmonton Arts Council in collaboration with the Edmonton Transit Service. Catherine Kerr, then the Public Art Director for the Arts Council, characterized the project as a socially conscious initiative, working in close collaboration with the inner city community. As one of the artists, Leila Folkman said, quote, Pillars of the Community mirrors the diversity and reality of Edmonton. We wanted to celebrate the unsung heroes, daily faces, and the less heard or underpraised people who call this city home, end quote. Five large portraits of inner city community members, Brian, Noah, Fatima, Mike, and Vanessa, grace each of the 10 meter high concrete slabs, which cover a large public transit air vent near the community rink in the Rogers Place development. The mural is part and parcel of the processes and practices of neoliberal gentrification. Rory Kraft has identified three interconnected, globally mobilized governance strategies for managing lagging post-industrial economies. One, creative city urbanism. Two, heightened securitization and penal governance of spaces and populations deemed threatening to a city's economic competitiveness. And three, 
cultivation of a neoliberal consumer citizenship. The Pillars of the Community Project dovetails with these three strategies in Edmonton's new ICE district and how these portrait murals of quote unquote disenfranchised folks further ideals of community engagement while ensuring that a certain type of urban sport consumer will be made to feel comfortable, welcomed and reassured by sanitized individualized representations of the diversity of the pre-existing neighborhood. Difficult difference is aesthetically managed and diffused through these representations. The entrepreneurial assemblage composed of corporate capital, public-private partnerships, arm's length municipal councils, and frontline social service providers comprise the nonprofit industrial complex, a powerful juggernaut in this prairie oil and gas city. We end this section of our presentation by suggesting how another mural produced under much different circumstances better exemplifies what is at stake here now through a particular graffiti conversation. As Henri Lefebvre famously argued several decades ago, space is always already political, saturated by ideology and contested in its formation. <clears throat> Murals have become a popular means of marking public space, engaging communities, particularly communities at risk, read structurally disadvantaged and systematically disempowered to build capacity, develop skills and beautify neighborhoods. Edmonton has not been immune to this city building tactic. Early in 2016, as the arena was being finished, a frontline worker from Boyle Street Community Services attempted to make inquiries of both the Oilers and the city about the possibility of accessing space and funds. He envisioned the development of a community-led mural project with inner city folks designing and painting the installations. His initiative went nowhere until about three months later in the summer of 2016, when in an interesting reversal, Boyle Street was approached by the Edmonton Arts Council to see if they had any interest in partnering on a mural portrait project. They agreed and a local photographer was commissioned to take community members photos. Somewhere between 40 and 50 faces were captured on film. A committee composed, composed of Arts Council members, representation from Edmonton Transit Service and workers from Boyle Street met to decide who the artists for this mural project would be. Layla Folkman and Lacey Jane Wilburn were chosen. Former Edmontonians who were graduates of Victoria Composite, the city's fine arts high school, the two white women returned home from Montreal where they had honed their mural craft in that city. Five photos were chosen by the artists that represented a quote, spectrum of experiences, genders, ethnicities, ages, and lives, end quote, that comprised set several central neighborhoods. Painting started in September with youth from Boyle Street working with the two artists to learn skills in composition and technique. About one week before the official unveiling of the mural project, a city police officer contacted City Hall to object to one of the portraits. Tyrone, as he was called, was allegedly gang involved, had caused harm in the community and was currently serving time in jail. There was pressure applied to the Arts Council to remove his portrait. After a series of reportedly difficult meetings, Tyrone's mural was replaced by Brian's. This upset several inner city workers and advocates. As one of them said, quote, it was the face of an Aboriginal person wiped out from the collective story of public art in Edmonton. I have mixed feelings, but I also feel public art should be controversial. The fellow whose face is up there hasn't exactly been a good guy. I can't say it was the wrong decision, but it's an important thing for us to, dis to discuss as a society, particularly when obviously they just want to have happy, good feelings over at Roger's place. Instead, there needs to be some talk about where do we house this guy? How do we deal with his trauma? How to deal with the things he's done wrong? How do we help the families he's wronged? But really, instead of having these conversations, we just wash his face over and hope for a happier face." End quote. This incident helps to highlight some of the cracks in this purportedly benevolent community art initiative. Kraft's three strategies mentioned earlier are worth repeating in the wake of this act of artistic censorship. The first point, 
that of creative city urbanism suggests that community mural making becomes part of the apparatus of creative city governance. Pillars of the community forwarded a semiotics of community experience according to normative regimes of the politics of difference, an economy prefiguring the representational limits to what can be understood and visualized about targeted populations and spaces deemed other and thus problematic to the project of urban transformation. This not only follows the well-trod path of Canadian multicultural discourse, in addition, it seemingly justifies acts of artistic censorship in the service of creating safe spaces for moneyed sports consumers. It also sets up the conditions for Kraft's second point, that of increased securitization and penal governance, which can be read in multiple ways in this situation. Incarceration is not uncommon among the folks that comprise the Boyle Street community. Neoliberal, neoliberal policing targets racialized and impoverished populations for minor legal infractions, which often lead to jail time. And as state support for social wel welfare programs disappears, the carceral system is rapidly filling the void. Additionally, and as we outlined earlier through our ethnographic research, we clearly observed new security zones produced by both the Edmonton Police Service and by private security hired by Rogers Place. Pre-existing community members were regularly moved on, ticketed and or forcibly removed within an approximate three block radius of the arena. Only those who were appro appropriately quiet and deferent were allowed on occasion to stay put. Removing any representation of so-called threatening or disruptive individuals is entirely congruent with this policing strategy. Therefore, all embodied versions of uncontrollable difference must be removed from the area around the arena and the static mural representations stand in, in that space of the arena as individualized stories of quiet, legible success. This leads to Karath's third point, that of cultivating neoliberal consumer citizenship. It is here where the tragedy of Tyrone's demise, both as an image and a life, hits home. Tyrone's face was removed from the mural project. He did go to jail and he died while inside. In direct contrast, Brian, whose image replaced Tyrone's, a white man with a troubled past, has been more supported in life. Described by the Edmonton Arts Council as a, quote, joyous example of positive self-reclamation through community engagement, end quote, Brian embodies the individualized success story of the neoliberal citizen. He has overcome involvement in illegal drug culture, kicked his addiction, and his mural image has been picked up as part of a social justice marketing campaign by the bank, ATB Financial. Tyrone and Brian exemplify part of Foucault's biopolitical mantra in literal terms those left to die, and in Alberta that has always disproportionately marked Indigenous people, and those who are supported in life. Brian got lucky, in the right place, at the right time, and was rewarded for performatively displaying his compliance as a self-responsibilized global city participant and collaborator in realizing creative city aspirations. This political sensibility is restricted to practices of one's own self-care, non-state dependency and understandings of community as a localized mechanism for securitization and productivity. What mural projects like Pillars of the Community do is participate in this pacified political sensibility, neatly aligning with a particular form of aesthetic engagement that is clearly linked with creative city entrepreneurialism. Rather than overreach and try and read this mural near Rogers Place as a disruptive a disruptive possibility to city and corporate power, a piece of graffiti street art produced in the fall of 2019 far more effectively exposes the geopolitical fault lines at play in this city. On October 18th, 2019, activist Greta Thunberg visited Edmonton and in the space of three days, local activists organized a rally and march that attracted over 10,000 people an extraordinary number for this conservative province that relies on the fossil fuel industry. To celebrate the event, a street art portrait of Thunberg was produced by a local graffiti artist on an LRT abutment about eight blocks east of Rogers Place. 
This free wall is, as one community member asserts, where the inner city's public art really lives. Graffiti art is self-managed on this stretch of concrete and the city leaves the artists alone for the most part. There is a lot of artistic talent and pulse in this space. So on October 18th, the street art portrait of Greta was completed in honor of her visit and rally. The original undefaced piece captured here on film by a community member, Bill Nyes, who was out on an early morning walk and generally, generously shared this image with us. Not only thanks the Swedish teenage activists directly, it also clearly thanks the Beaver Hill Warriors, a grassroots indigenous youth food sovereignty group who collaborated with Climate Justice Edmonton to organize the October 18th March and rally. Within 48 hours, go home, this is oil country was sprayed over top. It was then further defaced with both misogynistic and xenophobic slurs. In marked contrast to the placid, happy faces of Noah, Brian, Mike, Vanessa, and Fatima, the public graffiti space became a, communica a communicative canvas for the complex and competing conflictual relations in this prairie city. Indigenous sovereignty, climate change activism, and community solidarity came up against reactionary misogyny, racism, and climate change denial. We conclude now by suggesting that this graffiti conversation captures the zeitgeist of this city. It did a better job of articulating what is at stake for those left to die in the increasingly polarized political climate of this contested Canadian petro city and the social costs and unequitable divisions, rapacious resource extraction and its sporting entertainment diversions produce. Each of these industries are publicly funded and explicitly state supported, reproducing colonial logics and exclusions. As we have shared with you over the last 45 minutes, only particular kinds of people belong and are welcomed to oil country. This is a stark reminder that the production of consumptive sporting leisure experiences is never politically innocent. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for your presentation. Um, we, uh, I don't know if you can see, but you're getting a lot of claps uh, right now. <laughs> um, I, I, we can take some questions. We, we do have a few minutes. Um, you could, uh, if you could raise your hand or um, actually raise your hand would probably be the, the best way to do it. Um, I can go from there. Just before we go into questions, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Jordan Cook, who has joined the call. He's a, he was an essential part of our arena walks during those Oilers games. Uh, Cynthia. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for a great presentation. So I'm very familiar with uh, your work, and I, I was fortunate enough to be working uh, in the area of my own research at the same time. And so I have a question, uh, probably, well, for all of you, but Dr. Davidson about the mural, because I vividly remember being there when the mural was being built, and I worked with a lot of the youth that work on it and there was a huge sense of pride um, in doing that and and I find that um, even those that are the victims of the neoliberal state uh, fall under that myth of you know this is good for the community and um, yeah this is good for us and 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 so I'm always curious as to how do we move away or how do we work with organizations to get that understanding that this is perpetuating that neoliberal state, this is perpetuating the, the good citizen mantra of the neoliberal uh, society. And, and, and so I've always struggled with that because like I said, there's such a sense of pride, but yet it's even when you, when you hear people that, so quote unquote, make it out of poverty or whatever, it's this, neoliberal myth of, well, they worked hard and that's why they did it, right? So I just want to get your sense, maybe from all three of you on how do we, how do we work with that and, and, and get people to move away from that myth, basically. Well, 
I think it's the $64 million question, isn't it? I mean, aren't we all, we're all caught. Like neoliberalism doesn't just differentially apply to some and not others. Like we're, we're all caught within its mechanisms. And this is, you know, just one example of how it works. And I guess um, what I what I do want to say is um, it was the point that I'm trying to make in this does not it's a both and I actually really want to be clear I don't want to deny the pride that I think was um, the buzz around that when that mural project opened was was very much um, it was a positive thing people were really excited it was an alternative form of representation. So I, I, I want to say that it's a both and kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the other things to think about is just how um, various mural installations do various things, right? So I also think about the mural that Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch did with community members on the back wall of the iHuman building, right? As again, another alternative form of mural making that um, so for those that are not there, iHuman is another nonprofit agency downtown. It has a mural on its, uh, its back wall or side wall, I guess, um, that there's lots of different ways in which murals operate. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, Rylan, I want to toss this one to you too, because you've thought a lot about this. I'm still thinking. Uh, I was hoping to come up with something brilliant before you threw I'm it I'm getting there. back at you for the hard question you had at my PhD defense, so there you go. <laughs> which, which you passed. <laughs> um, I don't know, That's it's definitely that that struggle through the process of, of participating in, in projects like that. And I think a good question to always be asking before, during, or after is like, why is this happening? And then what is it, what is it accomplishing? So. Uh, if you're, you know, if it's any kind of sport, leisure activity, artistic uh, projects, like making a mural, uh, getting the people to, to ask those questions while they're participating in it and uh, to make sure that that's part of the learning process as well. And while, yeah, it might be enjoyable. And like Judy said, it's the $64 million question. I think it's the, the big thing is like continuing to ask questions while you're doing it and thinking about Yes, you might personally benefit from, from a particular aspect of it, but what is going on on the whole with what's happening and how can you potentially change things in the future if there's things that you're not happy with when you start to answer those questions? I'll just add one more thing. Um, you know, the impacts of gentrification are, are, are uneven, they're complex, they're contradictory. And the Oilers, of course, are one of the most significant forms of belonging in this city. And there are Oilers fans in city centre uh, throughout. Um, so I'm not surprised whatsoever to hear that people found some joy in significant amounts uh, in feeling like they belonged to that development and to something that was associated with the Oilers in, in, in certain degree. So all these contradictions, I think, are really, really interesting. and and. Um, but again, you know, the literature on gentrification speaks to these types of, of really interesting um, issues and complexities that, um, that are there, that are stark. And I think that's what Judy's part of the presentation spoke to so well. And I'm going to throw one more thing in because I've had a little time to think, which is to say, um, in, in this moment of such radical um, inequity uh, between the rich and the poor, to just be blunt about it, when you can get, when as community members, you can get any kind of resource, you jump on it. And that actually is just important and you do it and you know it's, you know it's not perfect and you take it anyway because you got to get what you got to get. I mean, I think that's also just a really important thing to remember. Thanks very much. Uh, we, we do have time for one more question and, and Roger LeBlanc uh, uh, put a question in the chat. Uh, he said, he asked, uh, besides the mural, did any other positive elements arise from this project? You know, can I, can I start? Roger, sure. can, can I tell, I'm going to tell you a story. When Jay and I first 
started, I can tell the social worker story, Jay. When Jay and I first started this project, we, and, and because Jay had been very active in the actual arena debate leading up to it all, he was, he was known to city center actors as it were. So we were summoned or invited to a meeting with two city of Edmonton social workers and the city employed, what was she? She was, her job basically was to negotiate between the Oilers and the city and massage relations, right? That was her job. So we went to this meeting and really the gist of that meeting was, are you gonna say anything positive about the arena development or are you just gonna be critical, right? I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's hard. Yes, you can po point to small micro practices of positive things. For instance, um, one of the things uh, that happened with the arena development was there used to be trees in front of Boyle Street that used to provide shade. They, of course, have been taken down. But the mural project that I just talked about actually now provides shade in the summer. And so lots of folks sit in that shade provided by the mural. It's another way of existing. So yeah, um, you know, positive outcomes, panhandling opportunities maybe went up with the building of the arena, right? Those kinds of things. I don't know. There, keep going guys. What do you got? What else we got? <laughs> well, the, the few positive things, at least for me, have been vastly outweighed by the other things. The eviction. <laughs> the displacement, the policing. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of folks had hoped when the arena opened that it would bring, you know, it was gonna bring new people into the city center and that perhaps it would it cultivate new relationships and uh, new understandings between, you know, more affluent folks and, and others in the city center. Uh, we, we didn't really see a lot of that. You know, we saw the opposite. We saw lots of, uh, of off, comments, uh, a couple physical things, saw some good things in terms of individual gestures of benevolence. Um, but th this speaks to the history of, of the city and these types of divisions that are enduring to this day. And so yeah, Roger, it, it's, you know, micro things that Judy pointed out. It's the start of a new relationship and a long term one. So we'll see where it goes. The, the, the relationship didn't start well with the lack of a community benefits agreement, at least a legally binding one. So, I mean, that's another story that, that uh, we can talk about later. And I would just, yeah, just add on to, to both Jay and Judy with, I think anything that has been considered positive for the community has still been, like it was still a, the, like ultimately it benefits the gentrification process and it is done to reinforce that whether it's the, the art projects or names of parks or whatever, it's still building this narrative of ongoing settler colonialism. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm going to cut it off uh, right there just um, because we are going to be starting our next session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shear, Dr. Davidson and uh, Rylan for, for your presentation. It was excellent. And, uh, and I think you've had a, a lot of compliment. I don't know if you can see, um, but in the chat box, you have a lot of uh, people very supportive of the presentation and you did a great job. So congratulations and uh, uh, well done. And so now we are going to move on uh, uh, to our next part of the program where we will be having some more research presentations. Thanks everybody. <laughs>